Father in heaven, thank you today that you're still on your throne. Thank you that your throne is forever and ever. Everything else around us changes, but you don't. We're thankful for that today. And we're thankful so much for your word today that is still a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We're thankful so much that we have a sure word of prophecy that shines as a light in a dark place. And we're so thankful today that the light of your word shines in this world of deception and craziness yet today for us to give us strength. We just pray for the Holy Spirit to open our eyes today that we can see as you see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to take a look at a few Bible promises this morning. Uh, Psalms chapter 119. Psalms 119. Psalmist David declared, starting with verse 9, David said, Wherewithal, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee, Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. You know, it's interesting that sometimes when we look at our lives, our lives and times when we've made mistakes or hurt somebody or did something that we're not proud of, that becomes our focus. That becomes the thing that we dwell on. And then we beat ourselves over the back and we, you know, we, we get mad at ourselves. But I notice it's very fascinating in, in those verses we just read. David's focus was not on his sins. Wasn't on the wrong things that he did. David's focus was on filling his mind with the word of God. That was his focus. That was his, his goal because ultimately, folk, the psalmist, just like us, the one thing he wanted was to be one with God. He wanted a pure heart and a pure mind. But David made so many mistakes. But again, his focus was on taking heed to what God says. And I think the same is for us today. Our job is not to find the, the longest whip. Our job is not to find the, you know, the cords with which we can beat ourselves. That's not our job. Our job is to fill our mind with the words of God. And if we do... If we do that, if we focus on that, well, those things that the devil has sought to use to, to bring us down and to tear us up, they'll get smaller and smaller. And God's word will get bigger and stronger and more powerful in our lives. And that's what God wants for each one of us today today 
you know, I will never forget, and I'm starting to age myself now, but I'm among friends, and I don't think anybody will use that against me. I'm noticing some people are having to clear their throats. Anyway, when I was a junior, sophomore, junior in high school, I was profoundly affected by Watergate. Maybe some of you remember that. Watergate. When Richard, the President of the United States, Richard Nixon, and many of his co-workers, H.R. Uh, Haldeman and, um, uh, let's see, Colby was another man. And, uh, and all of these men were involved in breaking into the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C. to find dirt on various political opponents of Richard Nixon. And folk, I'll tell you, I just, I threw my hands in the air as a sophomore, junior in high school, and I said, who can I trust? I was so frustrated. I can't trust these men. Who do I trust? And so I started as a 16 or 17 year old young man to look for answers. Who can I trust? Where is there an absolute? And, and who will always be there for me? And folk, I'm, I'm just so thankful today that the Bible and the, the, the word of prophecy in the books of Daniel and Revelation, that those books shed such a beautiful light on what has gone on in our world, what is going on in our world, and what's just around the corner up ahead. You know, in the Bible, in 2 Peter, 2 Peter declared, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, Peter said, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Now, folk, there isn't a whole lot of stuff in this world today that is sure. But the Bible says we have a sure word of prophecy. Well, I know for me, I started on a, a long voyage to look, to find answers. And I can say today that the right answers that I found was in the books of Daniel and Revelation. But you know, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle of, of history and current events that I just could never understand. And uh, so in our Prophecy Arise series, which we're going to look at today, part six, I've titled this one, the sermon, it's called The Papacy, the CIA, Heroin, and War. Next week, of course, we have communion, but we'll get back to our other series we're doing on God's amazing grace soon. But this morning... This is our sermon title. Revelation 17 depicts the Vatican's use of political leaders, high finance, churches, 
and war to bring about a revival of the world that they dominated throughout the Dark Ages. The Bible speaks in very general terms about this revival, but modern history portrays this takeover in words we are all familiar with in terms of names of people in the political, economic, and religious world. The peak begins. You know, Revelation chapter 17, and we've looked at this before, but just for a brief review, we find in Revelation 17, verse 1, it talks about the great whore that sits upon many waters. And of course, we know from Bible prophecy uh, and a host of Bible verses that an impure woman in the book of Revelation represents a church in apostasy. Revelation 17.2 says, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. So the political leaders of our world are in cahoots with this apostate church, which is the Roman Catholic Church. Revelation 17.5, the Bible says, Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So not only do we have the Roman Catholic Church system, Babylon the Great, but we also see that she has daughters, other religious groups or churches that are following right in her footsteps. And so the Bible calls them harlot daughters of the great mother. So we have here in Revelation 17 verses 1 through 5, we have the papal power, we have the political leaders of the world, and we have the churches of the world in verse 5 in corrupt harmony. Revelation 18 Verse 3 brings in another entity where the Bible says, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So now we're introduced to the money people of the world, the great international bankers, the great business people of this earth, they too are working with Babylon the Great. So we have these four entities, Romanism, the churches of the world, the political powers of the world, and the great economic men of this earth, all working together today. Well, let's see if we can't find out a few things about some people that we might be familiar with. Do I have to mention, who are these people right here in this picture? Who's this guy right here? Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin, of course, the leader of Russia from about 1924 to his death in 1953. And who is this man right here? What's his name? Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was the President of the United States from 1933 to 1945, the only president to ever serve more than two terms. And then, of course, this man who led out in England, what was his name? Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill. That's right. Now, according to the Bible, these men would be considered what? Would they be considered merchants? No, they weren't merchants. They were political leaders. So they were the kings of the earth, weren't they? They were the kings of the earth. Now, 
During World War II, it was fast becoming obvious that the victors in the conflict would be the United States and Russia or the Soviet Union. That became clear. However, they each had different ideologies. Of course, Roosevelt represented America, which were capitalists, and Joseph Stalin was a communist. And so after World War II, for those of us that have looked at a little bit of history, there was something that developed, and it was called a Cold War. Okay, there was a Cold War. There was a conflict between the capitalist West, or America, and communism. And so they started jockeying for power. And the Soviet Union started spreading its wings throughout the world. And one nation after another started becoming communist. And it became so serious right at the time I was being born in the late 50s because there was a man down in Cuba, which was 38 miles from Key West, Florida, named Fidel Castro, and he was a communist. So this was really shaking up the world after World War II. Well, Revelation 17, as we just noticed, the Bible says that there was a great whore that comes from Rome that controls the kings of the earth. And the Bible says the woman is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So the papal power controlled both sides in this cold war. They controlled Stalin on one side and they controlled Roosevelt on the other. So they pushed Stalin to push communism, and then they pushed America to stop them. So they created a Cold War. Created a Cold War. Wrapped in a terrible Cold War, each side having the capability to destroy the world and each other, the Vatican worked behind the scenes to create their ultimate prize, the revival of the old world order. You see, folk, when we hear the terms today, the new world order, it's not new at all. It's not new. It's the old order that was in existence throughout the Dark Ages. And what is happening right before our eyes is a revival of what went on in the Dark Ages. And the Bible in Revelation 17, verse 8, speaks to that. It says, the beast, and the beast in Revelation 17 that carries the, the mother, the, the apostate church, it's simply the political power of the, the nations of the world that they give it back to Rome. Notice the political power of the papacy. It says that you saw it was. It was in existence during the Dark Ages. In 1798, they lost political power. But the Bible says, and they shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So the papacy had political power during the dark ages, lost it in 1798, but folk, in our time, the papal power is gaining rapid political authority in this world. And did you notice there, there's a group of people that oppose the power of the papacy. Their names are in the book of life. Their names are in the book of life. 
And as we turn and we look to Christ and we look to His Word to do for us what we can't do, our names will be put in the book of life. So how would the papacy, what would they use to revive the old world order of the dark ages? What would they use? Oh, they would use something called the Central Intelligence Agency. Towards the end of World War II, there was a military man in America. His name was Bill Donovan. Some people called him Wild Bill Donovan. I'm not sure exactly why, but I think we could probably figure it out. Wild Bill Donovan, he was a devout Roman Catholic. He was a Knight of Malta. And to become a Knight of Malta, you have to perform very, very special services in behalf of the Roman Catholic Church. And that's what Bill Donovan did. He was the original head of the Office of Strategic Services. It was called the OSS. And the OSS was the forerunner to the CIA. Now, on Wikipedia, from the computer, it says that Bill Donovan did not have an official role in the newly formed CIA, but with his protege, Alan Dulles, and others, he was instrumental in its formation. Having led the OSS during World War II, Donovan's opinion was especially influential as to what kind of intelligence organization was needed as a bipolar post-war world began to take shape. So the CIA was created. Now, what was the purpose of this organization? And, you know, the fact that it was created by a Roman Catholic, and most of the people that worked in the CIA were trained at Fordham University in New York, a Jesuit university. Many people have stated that the CIA doesn't actually mean the Central Intelligence Agency, but it actually means the Catholic Intelligence Agency. And what would the Catholic Intelligence Agency, what would they use that organization for? Well, it's very, very interesting in light of today. Now, the Knights of Malta that Bill Donovan was a part of, very significant in America today. It's a military order that is totally subservient to the Vatican. They go about secretly to carry out the purposes of Rome. The Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, John Roberts, is a Knight of Malta. The head judge in the United States. Leon Panetta, former leader of the Catholic Intelligence Agency, are just some of the current famous Knights of Malta. Now there's many, many more. So what would the CIA do? The CIA was created during World War II to create upheaval throughout the world in order to revive the papacy to world dominion. The CIA has been run and peopled by predominantly Roman Catholics. From all that the CIA has done, the Vatican alone has benefited. Well, what did they do? Well, the CIA what they did was 
is they created pockets and small armies in countries throughout Europe. And what those small pockets or those small armies were set up to do was if the Soviet Union came into, say, Italy, this contingency of men, this small military group of men, they would oppose the inroads of Russia into their country. You know, that's what they would do. Now that becomes deeply significant when we think about what we are constantly told about in the press today. We're told constantly today about ISIS. Folk, ISIS was created not in Europe, it was created in Afghanistan to be a small contingency, a small army of militant Islamic people to fight against Russia when they came into Afghanistan. So ISIS was a creation of the Roman Catholic Church. That's, they were created to fight first against the Soviet Union. How would they be funded in all these things? Well, it's interesting. The CIA, the Catholic Intelligence Agency, nobody knows how they get their money. That's the way it was set up. Details of the overall United States intelligent budget is classified. That means nobody can know where their money comes from. Under the Central Intelligence Agency Act of 1949, the Director of Central Intelligence is the only federal government employee who can spend unvouchered government money. Based on this statement, it's clear that no one is to know how the CIA is funded. It is classified information. The agency never had to account for the money it spent except to the president if he wanted to know. Otherwise, the funds were not only unaccountable they were unvouchered so that there was really no means of checking them. Since the CIA was unaccountable, they could hire as many people as they wanted. They could hire armies. They could buy banks. Now this is quoted in a book called The Secret History of the CIA's Involvement in the Narcotics Trade by an individual named Jamie Graham. So nobody knows where their money came from. How did the CIA get money to fund these small armies that they had set up in countries all over Europe and then eventually all over the world? Where did they get their money to do that? Nobody was to know. It was unaccountable. It was unvouchered. Well, the men who started the Catholic Intelligence Agency, Bill Donovan, Paul Helliwell, Alan Dulles, James Jesus, Angleton. Now three of these four men are all devout Catholics, the top three. Alan Dulles was a member of the CFR. They came up with an idea. They watched a leader in China 
who raised up an army called the Chinese National Army, a man named Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek was opposing the communist leader in China called Mao Zedong. Well, the way that Chiang Kai-shek raised money for his army was by selling drugs to the Chinese people. And by selling drugs that he got from Burma and Thailand, Chiang Kai-shek was able to build a big army to oppose Mao Zedong in China. Well, these four men, as they started the CIA, they said, you know what? We could do the same thing. We could make billions of dollars for the Catholic Intelligence Agency by selling heroin or cocaine to people in the ghettos of America's big cities. Did you ever hear... I remember in the 1960s when I was a little boy that, you know, we were told about Woodstock and we were told about, uh, you know, LSD and, and drugs in America. You know what, folk, before that time, there was hardly any drugs in America there were very, very few people that were considered addicts in America. Paul? They started selling it in the ghettos of Detroit, and I submit to you that the first 9-11 in this country was destroying Detroit, which was the capital, beacon city of, of capitalism in the world. So look at the history of Detroit from the 50s and 60s. But that's where they started selling it to the black people in the ghettos of Detroit. Paul's point for the camera is, is that they started selling drugs in the big cities. One, of course, was Detroit, Michigan. Um, and that's absolutely true. Uh, the people that were primarily targeted, it was the blacks in the ghettos of America's big cities. Uh, New York, Harlem, you know, right there in New York City, uh, Detroit, Chicago, uh, Houston, Miami, Los Angeles. They targeted the black population in these ghettos. And folk, from the time that these men devised this plan to begin selling drugs in the big cities of America, the number of addicts in America has grown exponentially. What's that, Nellie? It definitely. You see, Nellie, um, I think Nellie's comment was is that it's backfired on them because it's gone from the ghettos to the more affluent, to the middle class. Nellie, I don't think that's a backfire. I think that, that was the plan, you see. Whereas today, you can't go into any, into any city, into any town in America where drugs are not rampant. You can't. Orlando. Orlando, Florida. Eustace, Florida. Winter Haven, Florida. You know, I was talking with a friend out in Oregon recently. He was describing this, this really nice small town in south central Oregon. And he said, it's such a nice community. I said, do they have drugs there? He said, yes, they do. So, folk, it doesn't matter where it is in America. 
because of what these men decided so they could fund their armies in all these different countries around the world, they would sell drugs to American people. And that's where this epidemic of addicts began. It was back there. Paul? Paul? Absolutely. I mean, this is how they make their livings. So it became their trade, their business, and it didn't leave. It just grew and grew and grew and grew. That's Absolutely. The reason they did that, because it, all of a sudden it's fast, quick money pumping into these communities for drugs. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good point, Paul. Um, folk, the amount, you know, I, I put in here the, the number billions of dollars. We are talking mega billions of dollars. These men, primarily Heliwell, made deals with drug lords in Burma, Thailand, and, well, what do you know? Where did America go to fight a war? Vietnam. They would grow the poppy plants manufactured into heroin, opium, sell it to the CIA agents, and then it would be sold in U.S. cities. This is how the CIA would finance their projects of war. You know, it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me. As, as I look at this slide, I think of, a, of an older brother of mine that died prematurely because he got involved in drugs. And I then think of within the last 16 or 18 months going in to my little post office in Eustis, Florida. And there is a man who is greeting me before I go into the post office and he says, Sir, Will you sign this petition because we want to legalize pot in the state of Florida? And I said, sir, I'm not interested. You know, and as I walk away, he says, oh, you're one of those rednecks. Folk, he can call me whatever he wants to. But yeah, just don't call me late to dinner. That's right, Dennis. But folk, the point is, is, Drugs, it was all planned to destroy so many people in America. And I am so thankful today that as this epidemic is sweeping over America, we have an option. We have an opportunity to say no, no to drugs, and to say yes to Jesus Christ. To say no to a world that will lead me to an early death and to say yes to an absolute in the word of God. I am so thankful today that there is a choice that we can make one that will bring us great happiness as it did to Daniel and his friends and say no to that path that only leads to devastation and sorrow. So the drug lords of the world, they, they create this market for a drug trade throughout the world you know, the Bible, in Revelation 18, verse 23, notice what the Bible says. It says, The light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. The voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Revelation 18, 23. 
Folk, that word right there, sorcery, we think of the word witchcraft, spiritualism, but you know that Greek word that John used? It's this word right here. It's pharmakia. Pharmakia. And from the word pharmakia, what English word do we get? Pharmacy. Pharmacy. And when we think of pharmakeia and pharmacy, what do we think of? Drugs. Drugs. Now, of course, yeah, prescribed drugs. Absolutely, Nelly. It's being it's being sold as if you know this this is going to be the answer. And uh, but, folk, notice the papal power with the merchants of the earth creating a drug culture, an epidemic in our world today, whereby they can make billions of dollars to create the old a new world order, just as they had during the Dark Ages. Now, probably a place you guys have never heard of. I hadn't heard of it till recently. But there was an area in Burma called the Shan Plateau. This area, folks, it's right near Thailand, Vietnam, right there in Southeast Asia. But this plateau became the largest opium-producing region in the world. The protection of this heinous drug trade was carried on in America from 1947 to 1967 with not a single major drug bust. Why? Why was there not a single major drug bust for 20 years as drugs are pouring into the United States? Why? It's because of what Paul just said, folk. It's not just the Catholic intelligence agency that's becoming super wealthy over this, but it's policemen. It's local law enforcement that are turning a blind eye. Why? Because they're getting monies too. You know, there's a young lady in this room, Kadisha, isn't there, that told me a couple of weeks ago that she wants to be a police officer. You know what? She's going to have to make a decision, isn't she? Because... Kadisha, if, if you go into law enforcement, and I, and I hope you do, but young lady, there's going to be so many people who are going to say, look, you make this amount of money a year, I'll double that if you just let us carry on our drug trade right underneath your nose. And so... She's going to have to make a decision. Am I going to do it right? Or will I be bought off like so many other law enforcement people have been before me? But that's what's going on, folk. The number of heroin addicts in America in this time frame rose from 20,000 to 150,000 in the United States. And folk, the figure today is probably in the millions. In the millions. With the production of tons and tons of heroin and its sale in America, money was flowing like a river. The money had to be count accounted for in some way if it were to be done legally. Where 
where do you deposit billions and billions of dollars into a bank where a bank person doesn't finally say, you know, you're depositing an awful lot of money. Where are you getting it from? So how would the Catholic Intelligence Agency, how would they get the money into some bank and then clean it up and then have it go to other banks and so that nobody would get into trouble? How could you do that? How do you pour billions of dollars of dirty money into banks without someone becoming suspicious? I get on a plane in Australia in Brisbane and I have to sign a declaration form that says, do you have more than $10,000 of Australian currency in your possession? If I, if I mark that yes, Folk, the local authorities in the Brisbane International Airport, they are on you like bees to honey. Where did you get that money? How, how did you get that? They want to know everything. So how do, you, how do you take billions of dollars and put it into banks without nobody being suspicious? That's impossible. Where in the wide world could you find a secretive bank that answers to no one and who would be willing who would be willing to dirty their hands in the blood money of narcotics How could it happen well, in Operation Gladio, a book by Paul Williams, he said the money had to be channeled through a financial firm that would not be sub subjected to scrutiny by the U.S. Treasury agents or international fiscal monitors. Only one such institution possessed such immunity and it was located in the heart of... Vatican City. So let's see. The Catholic Intelligence Agency, CIA, would have all this drug money. They would take it and secretly give it into the Vatican Bank in Vatican City. Then the Vatican Bank would clean it up and then send it on to various banks in Switzerland and Germany and then to America. And nobody could ask any questions. Why? Because the Catholic Church is a separate, independent bank in an independent country And they leave no paper trail. No paper trail. There's the Vatican Bank in Vatican City. The bank remains a sovereign financial agency within a sovereign state. It cannot be compelled to redress wrongs, not even the worst violations of international law. It cannot be forced to release the source of any deposit. The bank resides under the jurisdiction of the Pope. He owns it. He controls it. That's from Paul Williams' book, Operation Gladio, page 45. Now that's dirty business, folk. That's dirty business. Because of its clandestine workings, millions can be deposited into the Vatican Bank on a continuous basis and channeled into Swiss bank accounts without the possibility of detection. It has the perfect place, it was the perfect place for the CIA and the Sicilian Mafia to launder their ill-gotten gains 
of the narcotics trade for the Roman church to fund their political mission. According to Money Val, the Anti-Money Laundering Committee of the Council of Europe, it remains one of the world's leading laundries for dirty cash under Pope Francis. You say, oh, but Bill, I've been told that Pope Francis, he's a wonderful man. He's a wonderful man. He cares about poor people. Folk, Francis is evil. Francis is laundering drug money through the Vatican as we speak. Revelation 18, 11, uh, 15 to 18, the Bible says the merchants of these things, they were made rich by her, and her is Babylon the Great, the Roman papacy. And when the papacy falls, the merchants say, oh, that great city, it was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, decked with gold and stones and pearls. They're so sad, for in one hour so great riches has come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? Folk, they were rolling in drug money. Rolling it in. Now how did it work? For every hundred dollars of drug money that was sent to the Vatican Bank, the Vatican received fifteen dollars. That's fifteen percent. For every thousand, the Vatican received a hundred and fifty. For every million, the Vatican received a hundred and fifty thousand. For every billion dollars, the Vatican received a hundred and fifty million. I am so thankful today. I am so thankful today that I don't have to be wrapped up in this rat race. That I don't have to trust in politicians that are not working for my benefit. I am so thankful today that I can step away from the way the world does it and I can look to Jesus and I can trust him and he will always be there for me. I'm so thankful, folks, today. You say, oh, but Bill, these, these people, they have it made in the shade, you know? They're living in luxury as far as this world describes it, but folk, it's coming to an end. It's not going to always last. It's not always going to keep going that way. Revelation 18, 19 to 21, the Bible says, they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing and saying, alas, alas, that great city, the Roman church, Wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. Rejoice over her, heaven and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Folk, this horrible system of false religion of lying politicians, of apostate churches, and of drugs, it's going to come crashing down. It's going to be destroyed by the God of heaven. That's what the Bible says. 
And I am so thankful that we can choose today. We can choose to follow Christ. We can choose to follow His Word. We can choose to trust in His promises that will not fail us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you today. David faced a monster in the valley of Elah. We face a monster today. Thank you that David took a little stone and it knocked the monster down. Father, I pray that we would fill our minds we would fill our minds with your words, with those little stones of truth, with your promises, so that when we meet the monster every day, we will trust your word to knock him down. Thank you that he can. Thank you that he will. In Jesus' name, amen.